Uh, I'm going to start um, today's talk. Uh, welcome everyone um, to this talk on green investing. I am Sophie Nelson and um, I am a member of the Watlington Climate Action Group um, and I am part of the steering committee and I am also co-treasurer. The talk today will last approximately an hour and is being recorded. Um, the recording itself will be placed on the website um, for anyone who can't make it today. Uh, Sammy McMillan, who is with us right now, um, is a recent economics graduate and she has an interest in green investing. She's helped me organize this talk and she has kindly agreed uh, to, um, to present today's speakers. Sammy, over to you. Thanks, Sophie, and hello, everyone. So um, ethical investing is becoming increasingly popular. There's been loads of new um, environmental, social and governance funds. So you'll see the acronym ESG, which is environmental, social governance, pop up a lot in the news. And this trend is expected to continue with loads of established players setting up their own ethical funds, too. So there are so many options out there. It can be really difficult to choose, especially because a lot of the funds claim to be ethical, but not as much as we would have liked. So hopefully this talk will guide you a little more um, where to look and what to look out for. So we're lucky enough to have two speakers today who um, represent organizations that are based in Oxfordshire. Firstly, we'll have Rachel Manton from Ethex giving us an overview of the ethical um, investment sector. And then we'll hear from Saskia Huggins from the Low Carbon Hub and giving us an overview on any local opportunities that they have available. We'll then move on to any questions and feel free to post any you may have on the chat box. If not, we can answer them all at the end. But remember this talk isn't provided, isn't intended to provide financial advice. It's aimed at making you aware of what's out there and just where to look. So Rachel, over to you. Thanks, Sammy. And thanks for the opportunity to uh, come and talk to you guys about ethical finance. Yeah, it's a subject that's pretty dear to my heart having been in the space for about sort of 20 years in different guises. Um, so I've just got a few slides to kind of um, just give you a bit of background on ethics and then sort of get into what are some of the things to think about, um, you know, when looking at sort of greening your finances. Um, so is it okay if I just share my screen? I guess if you can, yeah, move to the next slide, please. Brilliant. So just to give you a bit of background on ethics, we're... Um, about enabling people to directly invest in projects to make their money uh, do good. Um, so we, you know, we've been around for the last sort of six, seven years, um, and we're trying to make it easy for people to use small amounts of money um, to invest ethically in organizations that are sort of contributing to a more positive and sustainable world whilst also targeting a fair financial return. Um, next slide, please. Um, so just to give you a, an idea, we reached a bit of a milestone across both the FX platform and another a platform that we run, Energize Africa. We've raised um, 100 million through our investor base, which is fantastic. So that's 20,000 people investing from 50 pounds in community shares, um, bonds, in things like community owned energy. So 60 million of that has been um, invested to support 70 community renewable energy projects like Low Carbon Hub up and down the country, um, helping to green and produce community owned, um, you know, kind of clean energy, be it solar, wind, um, hydro and creating, you know, green jobs. Then 8 million has been raised and invested in sustainable housing and that's looking at kind of um, retrofitting um, new technologies to reduce emissions, passive house approaches. Um, you know, so it's great to see that now kind of um, being, uh, being a priority for organizations to bring on board sort of um, permanently affordable housing, but that that is definitely rooted in uh, um, low carbon energy efficient practices. And then um, more recently we you know, we've been working a lot with, um, an organization that's about giving people access to land, but doing it in a sustainable, eco-agricultural, sympathetic way. Um, and they raised two million pounds in terms of uh, equity over the last two or three years. And we've been working with um, vehicle infrastructure, electric car charging points, electric car clubs, e-bike clubs um, in Exeter and the Southwest. 
um, to scale up what they're doing uh, to provide alternative, you know, transport and car sharing and reduce the need for um, ownership of combustible engines. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, we've got a, a platform where we've raised um, 20 million um, from UK investors, um, along with finance from UK aid to help finance the rollout of clean energy access across uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Um, next slide. So that's 100 million. It shows you kind of, it's a lot of money, but what um, you know, great use it can be put to. And, and Saskia will, uh, will cover that in more detail with respect to Low Carbon Hub um, shortly. So ethical investing. Um, next slide, please, Satnam. So what's really interesting is that research we participated in with the UK government at the end of 2019 said 70% of people when asked if they want to save and invest for a better world, remarkably um, not, um, said that they, they wanted to do that. The main issue preventing them is a lack of access to easily understandable, available financial products that... Um, aren't confusing, are very transparent, and you know, aren't, uh, aren't kind of uh, susceptible to greenwashing. So next slide, please. So the problem that we've got is the finance sector, you know, over the last sort of decade, has been encouraged to act, be it around kind of um, the UN FCCC climate change negotiations, but it has been pretty, excuse the pun, glacial. Um, to say the least. And as Sammy mentioned, you know, there's there's probably a few different reasons why, but one, you know, jargon is rife in the industry. People are talking about ESG, environmental social governance, CSR, corporate sustain, sustainable, uh, corporate social responsibility, I'm getting it wrong, ethical, sustainable, green, climate finance, you name it, different definitions. So how on earth are people <laughs> supposed to understand you know, where their money's going, what a product is supposed to be offering them from an ethical perspective. Um, greenwashing is pretty prolific. You've got various different approaches from different organisations. So you've got those organisations that are positively, like ethics, seeking out opportunities to put their money into the good stuff. And then you've got other funds and um, products where basically investments go into normal everyday companies, but they're just screening out the bad stuff. So what would that look like? Um, essentially arms, tobacco, other things like that. So essentially you could be investing in a fund that isn't really doing the things that you want it to do actively, but you might be avoiding the bad things. Um, interestingly, number three, lots of the big corporate banks and Triodos um, publicized last year some research by bank track, even after they signed up to the Paris Agreement and the targets committed in 2015, in the preceding two, three years afterwards, a lot of the global banks' household names were pumping $1.6 trillion into fossil fuel projects. So, you know, that's not great to see and how does that stack up? Um, another big issue is a lot of people just don't feel they know, back to the jargon, back to a lot of the complex language, you know, enough about financial products or don't even see themselves as investors, um, you know, which is a problem. Um, and as we've said, ethical products aren't really as transparent as you might want them to be. You aren't necessarily connected with your money. You don't know if it's a fund exactly where it's going, doing that kind of research in terms of where the funds are investing is in incredibly time consuming. And then there's issues about, you know, regulatory constraints. So some of the things, the investment opportunities that we provide would be in the, um, what the FCA would say that 10% of your annual wealth, um, that should only be going into um, slightly illiquid, longer term, more risky kind of uh, products. And so, you know, our independent financial advisors, and others kind of really struggle to offer these opportunities because they they can't do the due diligence um, on these opportunities, um, you know, and, and it, it's a bit of a disconnect in terms of the regulatory um, environment. Um, next slide, please. 
So, you know, we've talked about that people don't see themselves as investors. Well, there's some, they, here are the main sort of financial products. Um, and um, I'd say, you know, two out of the three, most people have. So if we start with current accounts, you know, you might not be an investor, but everyone pretty much has a current account in the UK. And so there's some really easy things that people can do in terms of looking at bank track, looking at ethical consumer, which are good online resources to see how your bank ranks in terms of, you know, it's um, environmental proactivity, where it's putting their money. And it's relatively straightforward today to switch accounts. Um, so I would, you know, say as a first point of protocol, check where your current account is um, and, uh, you know, have a look around and see how their green credentials stack up um, with bank track and ethical consumer. Um, Savings, a lot of you are sort of familiar, I guess, with the ISA cash allowance. There are other ethical options out there that have a slightly different risk profile. So you've got stocks and shares, ISAs that um, organizations like, you know, Triodos and others will offer that are more ethically focused, but are riskier than a cash ISA that's protected, um, but obviously doesn't uh, generate in the current climate, you know, um, huge amounts of uh, returns. And then you've got the innovative finance ISA, which is a product that um, we as FX um, offer, which allows you to invest ethically um, and keep the gross return, but it is riskier. Your capital is at risk and, you, and, and returns aren't guaranteed. So when looking at these kind of products, you need to kind of weigh up it, you know, what kind of level of risk you want to undertake. Um, pensions. So this has been an area where there's been not a huge amount of development over the past years, but I'm glad to say, you know, it seems to be gaining momentum. Mm -hmm. So anyone who has a private pension is, is an investor. Um, and for those kind of, um, those people that are in their 20s, 30s, 40s that have gone through this auto enrollment process recently, you know, the auto enrollment, um, puts you in a, a pension and it won't be the sustain, most sustainable version. So a lot of people will have been also enrolled in a pension scheme with their organization. Um, and, you know, it's, it's kind of up to, up to you as an individual to look at how sustainable is that fund? Do I want to move my money around? Which are the pension funds, um, you know, that are doing good things in terms of um, being ethical? And what I would say is um, Richard Curtis, the filmmaker, got involved last year with a big campaign um, that's kind of building now through to COP um, at the end of this year called Make My Money Matter. And they're really trying to force um, pension companies to take on big commitments um, in terms of where their money gets invested moving forward. So I, I you know, I'd kind of encourage people to have a look at those campaigns, see whether, you know, their own pensions are invested um you know and, and check out um with organizations like good with money which are the most um ethical of the pension funds out there and then you know there's funds that we talked about which is where you invest in a fund and then your money is invested by a fund manager and we've talked about positive or negative screening um sometimes the thresholds to get involved uh, in terms of minimum amounts of investment can be um high um, and um, sometimes the, there are varying definitions of what's green and sustainable. So I think the best one that I've seen is a fund that called itself green, um, but was still investing in, in companies that ha were doing, um, that had revenues generated from high carbon assets. Those re revenues just had to be less than 25%. So you know, it's, it's thinking about, well, where can you find out more information about the funds um, and their sort of uh, ethical um, credentials? And there are there are definitely um, websites out there to help you. And then it's, you know, direct investing. You can start, um, you know, with platforms like FX, Energize Africa. There's other things like Abundance and, and others where you can start from £50 and invest in some really great organisations that are rooted in the community doing some fantastic um, things. But you've got to be mindful that often your capital is at risk um, and the returns that are promised aren't guaranteed and can fluctuate. Um, so that's things to be aware of. Um, next slide. 
So I've just sort of dropped in here, I think. Um, so I've, I've tr tried to group those different products um, and then make recommendations about good sources. So on the current account uh, and savings on the left, you've got various guides with Good With Money, who are ex-financial um, journalists that have set up a great website just to provide, to just demystify what's going on, to give people transparent information about, you know, how good, how good are current accounts, what are the saving options out there. So I'd sort of recommend having a look at Good With Money, and that's free to access. Ethical Consumer isn't, well, some of it's free, but some of it's uh, around a subscription service, but they, um, every two years, overhaul their money section, looking uh, particularly at, um, yeah, current accounts, pensions, funds, direct investing platforms like ourselves, uh, and we'll give you the kind of lowdown in terms of, yeah, who's, who's good, um, who's doing great things, and, you know, what are the ones to potentially watch out for and then one of the organizations that I look which is um which I mentioned earlier which is trying to keep banks honest is banktrack.org their primary focus is to really look at where the banks are deploying cash and to keep them honest and flag up where investments are going and they you know they shouldn't be going and um, pensions again it's 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 similar ethical consumer and good with money have some great guides to pensions and then I've just put the URL down in terms of this campaign, as I mentioned, by Richard Curtis um, called Make My Money Matter, mm. um, which is, you know, which I think would be worth definitely looking at and some of the commitments coming out of the pension funds. Um, next slide, please, Sanam. And then finally, in terms of funds and direct investments, and I've just put a few on the left hand side. Um, again, good with money, ethical consumer. And then there's a really good company called 3D Investing which um, I put the URL down there, which will rank the funds and look at all the funds and where they're invested and rate them according to their kind of ethical um, stances. Um, and 3D Investing cooperate quite a lot with their guides with Good With Money. And then we talked a bit about thresholds. There's a new, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with Big Issue. There's um, a new platform that they've launched called The Big Exchange which is, um, again, giving people access to funds that are highly sustainable. But what they're trying to do is um, not have a £5,000 limit. You can invest smaller, um, smaller amounts and it's aggregated up within some, um, some sustainable funds um, that they rate quite highly. So um, have a look at Big Exchange and kind of what they're doing. And then there's some guides, like I said, on the left hand side. On the Good With Money website, Good Guide for Pension 2020, Good Investment Review, you know, you've got um, Good Guide to Innovative Finance ISAs and Good Guide to Impact Investing um, and the Ethical Money um, section on Ethical Consumers. So they're just really great resources, some of which are free to access, some of which are um, an annual subscription, but I think personal subscriptions are around 20, 30 pounds a year. Um, next slide, please. So, um, and then one of the things that I'd like to plug, so um, I'm actually on the advisory board of a, well, of an initiative that was set up by Friends of the Earth um, and a peer-to-peer -peer, um, training organisation uh, called Enroll Yourself, and the programme's called um, Own It, and it started in um, 2019, uh, and basically it's, um, sorry if you're not female, but for, for women out there, who really want to understand a little bit more in a really relaxed coaching way, kind of supportive um, group, um, you can enroll on some of the programs. It's obviously shifted now from a COVID perspective into more online, but um, own it as something that Friends of the Earth and Enroll Yourself and uh, ourselves as ethics want to grow. Um, and just give women a really great space to kind of talk about money and learn about what the different options are and um, what should you be thinking about um, in a really kind of, I guess, soft, engaging, supportive way. So if anyone's really interested in, you know, learning a bit more after this uh, presentation and you're female, sorry, um, then check out Friends of the Earth and, uh, and the Own It um, program that that's uh yeah that we started a couple of years ago um because yeah they're doing some great stuff um next slide please uh and again so 
basically just uh, just quickly some conscious of time uh, given uh, given my slow start. So just a little bit about how ethics works and it's sort of a, a segue then in terms of uh, Saskia's presentation is people come to our platform and they may have 50, 100, 150, 200 pounds more depending on their, their wealth, but, but normally somewhere between 200 and 500 pounds. They'll choose to invest in a project um, or a number of projects. And, you know, we have renewable energy. Um, we talked about sort of... Um, sustainable transport and, and passive house projects. And sometimes um, with those projects, we have co-financing. So UK aid, um, we add co-financing to certain projects that's provided by the, gov the UK government. And also we have um, co-financing that we can add in from People's Postcode Lottery and MCS Charitable Foundation, which um, hopefully not steal any thunder from Saskia, co-invested in Low Carbon Hub, which is brilliant alongside individual investors. And then the idea is you put a small amount of money in, into a project um, that aligns with your values um, to deliver social environmental um, impact and um, target a financial return, usually from somewhere between two, three percent up to five, six percent, depending on the project. Um, next slide. Thanks, Satna. And so this is our, our new website and we're just all about trying to make it really easy and really accessible to invest in local projects, which, um, you know, across the UK. So we've got a project here from Bristol. We've got Vocalize that came onto the platform and, and Saskia will talk to you about Low Carbon Hub's amazing work uh, shortly. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then I've just got um, a bunch of case studies really about what our amazing investors have done um, for certain organizations. So I'll just briefly talk to this and then, then I'll sort of hand over to, um, uh, to Saskia. But CoCars, um, £665,000 invested by 300 um, investors in the UK in withdrawable shares targeting a 5% return. And basically that's enabled um, co-cars to scale up their acquisition of new electric cars, put more vehicle infrastructure in. They're working really closely with Exeter Council and other councils across the Southwest. Um, and generally, you know, they've tapped into this kind of finance to really help them accelerate and scale what they're doing, uh, taking cars off, road, off the road and reducing um, their carbon emissions. So, um, and what was really interesting was they raised that money in the height of the COVID pandemic. So for me, it's really brought home, I think, to people how important it is as we build back better, that we do it in a way that creates values, uh, value for the communities that these organizations kind of are rooted in and, and serve. So um, I, think, I think I'll leave it there if that's okay, Satnam, I'm just conscious of time. Great. Well, thank you, Rachel. That was really informative. Um, investing can be very daunting if you don't really know where to look. So all those links look great. And it's also good to know that there's some places where you can start small. Um, you don't, the places don't have massive um, in minimum investments because I know that can be a problem too. So now I'd like to hang it over to Saskia Huggins, who's a social impact director from the Low Carbon Hub. Thank you very much. I'll just get this set up, proper view. Great, hopefully everyone can see that's my first slide. Lovely. So thank you so much for inviting me to join you tonight to tell you a little bit more about the Low Carbon Hub um, and in particular our Community Energy Fund. So I was going to give an overview of the organisation, not least because I hope quite a lot of the activities that we do may be relevant to your broader work as a group and then go into a little bit more detail about the Community Energy Fund, which is a direct investing opportunity um, following on from Rachel's theme. So for those of you that haven't heard of us, um, we're an Oxfordshire-based social enterprise, and we're out to prove it is possible to meet our energy needs in a way that's good for people and good for the planet. So if I start off by explaining how our business model works. So we use investment and loans, um, and we take this money and install community and renewables right across Oxfordshire. So here on the, uh, the tracks were the tracks that the solar panels that are now sitting on Nettlebed Primary School um, went down on. And on the right is uh, Fir Tree Junior School at 
Wallingford. They're the nearest projects I could find to where you, you guys are at the moment. Um, these panels are generating green electricity, so immediately reducing carbon emissions. So to give you an idea of their impact, the 35 kilowatt peak array at Fir Tree is around, providing around 40% of the school's energy needs each year. But um, these are just two of um, our 47 renewable energy projects across the county, shown here on the map. And the one in blue is um, our hydro at Sanford. It's the largest community owned hydro on the Thames. So we have a mix of uh, renewables in our portfolio. So between them, these are generating around four and a half gigawatt hours of green electricity a year. So just under the power that's used by one and a half thousand typical homes in a year. And um, so between them, they're beginning to make quite a tangible contribution to cutting our county's um, carbon footprint. But um, so it's good for people, but also good for uh, good for planet, but also good for people. And these are the, some of the people that are involved with and um, supported by our projects. So the capital that we have comes from currently 1,312 investor members. These are people who have entrusted us with some of their money which has enabled us to build those projects and as a thank you for um, loaning us their money effectively well investing in us they actually will own part of us um, we can pay them an interest rate each year as a thank you for providing that capital we're selling the electricity to the host organizations, the schools who have them on their roofs at a discount so they're getting an immediate benefit in terms of reduced electricity bills and last year that amounted to about £60,000 of savings for the schools who are hosting them and then as an organisation that's run for the benefit of the community 100% of our surplus is then used to support further carbon cutting activity in our community and in particular it's supporting the work um, of our 33 community shareholder members so they're 33 community groups, including your own, who are one of our most recent members, who own a share in the Low Carbon Hub, and as a result, um, can benefit from some of these services and grants from us. So I'll go into a little bit more detail about those. So, I so say some of this surplus is given out in grants, and a reminder that you've got until the 14th of February to put in an application for a £500 grant we offer these each year for um, to our community groups. Um, our aim being that um, any group who can put an application that meets the criteria of the grant, that that's something that you can expect to receive. We also run a more competitive grants program, but if you've, yeah, you've got just less than a week to put in an application and then from the 1st of April, the year starts again. So you've got another, um, another chance then. And the kinds of things that people have applied for and use the grants for range from a huge number of things. They've all got to do with helping directly cut energy use. So it could be about educational materials relating to renewables for school children, supporting a local PV array, insulation. This is Hogacre Eco Park that's just had some insulation work done. Thermal imaging training, um, campaigning for healthy streets and active travel. These are all things that the grants have gone towards. We also use some of the community benefit to offer some uh, services and help and advice. So we run a help desk and we can support groups and individuals who are looking to develop or find out more about community energy projects. So we, through the help desk, we can't support individuals wanting to do their own house, but we can offer support if you as a group are trying to find out more about community energy. And we've also teamed up with Westmill Solar Co-op, which is another community energy organisation. And we pulled our community benefit funds to offer free energy advice. So um, if you've got a community building that would like a free energy audit that normally costs £630, um, you can apply for one. So Chinna Village Hall, Ibsden Village Hall have had um, energy audits and it's completely free to the organisation and you can fill in a nomination form to put forward a building that you think would benefit. So as well as um, 
the work that we, um, the money that we're spending our money on, sort of giving grants, giving advice. We also use it to leverage additional government grants and support. And in particular, we've been trying to look for opportunities which we can deliver some powering down. So things like um, energy efficiency projects to us are just as important as the community generation side of things, which we're better known for. And as I often say this, but for me, the greenest unit of energy is the unit that you don't use. It's not the one that you generate. So we've got a number of programs running that are supporting energy efficiency. Some of these I think some of you are already aware of. So Cozy Homes Oxfordshire is helping homeowners take a whole house approach to reducing their carbon footprint. It is a paid for service, but the first step is a free plan builder that anyone can go in, look at their house and use it to begin to think about their journey to really reducing the carbon footprint of their home. Less CO2 is a schools programme for energy efficiency. We've launched in the last year Energy Solutions Oxfordshire which is a one-stop service, which is particularly for small and medium enterprises looking to undertake energy improvements. Our Ox Futures programme is a partnership that was looking to really support and boost the local low carbon economic development right across the county. So SMEs looking for energy audits, so free energy advice, um, also grants towards carrying out some of that work and also innovation grants for low carbon technologies have all been things we've been able to support through that program and um, again had a little look to see if there's anything local to you the nearest I could find was um, the Wee Bookshop in Chinna um, had an energy audit through that program and the furniture designers at Zarxy just just a bit north of you in Tetsworth um, have also had energy audits. So I was looking around, but have a, there's a little bit of a gap in your area. So I'm so pleased you guys are there now, because hopefully as a result, we can see more buildings and more, um, more organisations taking an active role in these opportunities, thanks to you lot. So one thing that all of these programmes have in common is that we're delivering them in partnership. Um, with other organisations. We feel so privileged to be working in Oxfordshire, which has got such a rich ecosystem of um, organisations um, from, you know, from the universities, the corporate sector, the local authorities, the grassroots communities. It's the most amazing ecosystem to be based in. And collaboration is at the heart of the most ambitious programme that we're currently running, which is Project Leo. And Project Lear, which is Local Energy Oxfordshire, is a £40 million collaboration, which is between commercial and public partners, as well as academics and communities. And together we're conducting a real world trial to understand the role that local energy can play in accelerating the transition to a zero carbon energy system. I won't go into a huge amount of detail now, but if you are interested, there's lots of webinars um, taking place and already available on our YouTube channel about those. But at the heart of it, Project Lee is about trying to understand how we go from this, hopefully you recognise DigCop with its um, six cooling towers, although they're not there anymore, to this very centralised carbon intensive um, energy system to this, which is our vision for a decentralized, decarbonized, and we hope democratized energy system where we can meet all of our energy needs, including heating and electricity, um, so heating and transport, but without the need for fossil fuels to drive that. Um, now, quite how we're going to get there, there's a huge number of organizations, not just Project Leo, lots of organizations and a lot of effort going to try and understand how we are going to do this transition to a zero carbon future and the route map that's gonna get us there is still under debate, but it's really clear that a really important first step is gonna be about increasing the amount of renewable energy um, to power all of this. And current estimates are we're probably gonna need about six times the amount of renewable energy in this country to make that happen. And for Oxfordshire, that really means solar. And at the Low Carbon Hub, we really want that to be in, as much as possible to be in community ownership because we think that way communities can have a greater say about how things like solar parks and the generation assets are created, how they're managed. And also you've got a better chance of the income, the benefits that they create actually staying in the local economy that way too. So on to the direct investment opportunity. 
we created the Community Energy Fund and it um, exists so that people can put savings to work supporting local projects that are going to tackle climate change and earn interest in return for your support. So we currently have a share raise that's open. We have a target of raising three million pounds this year. Our aim was originally, right, I can see Rachel smiling because our our aim originally was to raise one and a half million by the 31st of March, and then we're going to have a bit of a pause, and then we're going to come back and try and raise the remaining one and a half by November. And it was a really, it's it's more than we've ever, well, double what we've ever raised in a year. Um, and as of today, I could tell you that although we're some way off the 31st of March, we've hit two and a half million pounds. So we've just agreed to up the target for a second time <laughs> to three million. We we are astounded, as Rachel mentioned with Cove Cars, we launched in the time of COVID. It's just been extraordinary. So just to tell you a little bit about the nuts and bolts of the, um, the investment, when you invest in us, um, your investment takes the form of a withdrawable share in the Low Carbon Hub IPS. So we're a registered society, which you might have heard of a community benefit society, it's the same legal structure. And um, you can invest from, the minimum is £100. The maximum, if you've got very, very deep pockets, is £100,000. Um, tell you what that our targets are and our deadline if you were thinking of investing i should mention that we suspect that the at the current rate that half a million pounds which is our remaining target is not going to stick around for long and um, we've had weeks where we've raised four hundred thousand in a single week we we really can't yeah we we're amazed <laughs> um so the um, latest round of investments is going to be really critical for our, helping us with our plans for Project Leo. And I'll just say a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, but just a few more things about investing. In terms of who can invest, it's individuals who are 16 or over. Um, Organisations can also invest. It's also possible to apply for shares on behalf of children, but children aren't members in their own right at the moment. And when you join, you first of all, you become a member, so you'll own part of us. And with your membership comes voting rights. We're based on cooperative principles, so it's one member, one vote, regardless of your shareholding. And so you can vote at our AGM and you get to elect the board directors. We hope the biggest benefit is knowing that your mummy's mummy, mummy? <laughs> money is being put to use delivering local action on climate change. And we hope that the biggest benefits that our investors are looking for in terms of that social and environmental impact um, but we are also offering you a target interest rate four percent which rises to five percent at the end of the fourth year and that starts accruing from the day your membership's approved as Rachel said these are um, not without risk you need to be aware that interest is not guaranteed this is a target it's not a guaranteed rate it's got to be viewed as a long-term investment. Um, please read all the shared documentation to understand quite how long-term and hard it is to remove your capital. Um, and ultimately your capital is at risk, so don't invest anything that you cannot afford to be without. If that hasn't entirely put you off, then you can um, go to our website, lowcarbonhub forward slash invest where you can see all of the share offer documentation. It's so important that you read it and understand uh, what the opportunity is. And then when you're ready to invest, you pop over to the FX site and they handle all of the actual applications. So we're raising funds at the moment um, for a number of projects and in particular Ray Valley Solar, which I just wanted to tell you a little bit about. So, um, this is a new solar park. It's gonna be our first foray into solar parks. And um, at 19 megawatts, it's going to be the UK's largest community owned solar parks just south of Bicester um, at Arn the small village called Arncott, tucked behind um, Bullingdon Prison. 45,000 panels. And if you remember, I said our current portfolio of renewables is powering one and a half thousand homes, typical homes. This project alone is going to be over six thousand homes so for us it's going to be a massive step change in terms of the um 
amount of energy that we're generating. And also, as well as all the great environmental and social and community benefit that it will generate in terms of finances, it's going to be a really integral part of Project LEO because it's going to be creating this, what we call an anchor load, so a really large amount of um, power that we can then use in these real, real world trials. And because of that key role it's going to have, when you're investing in, the, in this current project, it's actually helping us unlock Innovate UK grant funding. We're only getting that uh, funding for Project Leo because we're also bringing in equity and investment. So this investment is unlocking all of that and so really going to be helping drive this local transition really directly by um, making this extraordinary the large and slightly scary <laughs> project possible. So um, I was going to end there. So we've still got a little bit of time for questions, I hope. Well, thank you, Saskia. It was great to hear that you really smashed that um, community energy fund target. That's great. And yes, we don't really seem to have many local investments. There does seem to be a gap in Wallington, but I'm sure that's something we could change easily. So um, now let's move on to questions. You can ask either directly now or in the chat box and we'll get to you. So does anyone have any burning questions? No, nope. okay, we'll move on to some that were on Facebook. Oh, yep, Terry, Sorry. go for it. I just wondered how easy or how difficult it would be for Watlington's scheme to get linked with Leo. So in terms of the trials, at the moment, the, um, the nine trial areas were set by um, specifically around particular primary substations that they wanted to test, and those have already been set. But um, so not. <laughs> unfortunately, that's going to be um, harder, but there will be other opportunities coming along. And if you guys are keen, we'll bear that in mind. Yeah, well, we've been trying to persuade. Um, we've got three sites uh, that now have planning permission, planning permission. Uh, two of them have outline permission and the two with outline permission. We've asked if they could become an exemplar development with lots of energy production with with a view to creating some kind of community energy scheme yeah, i think i've talked to you about that before yes yeah yeah no it's, and it's putting that that pressure on um you know we talked about projects that involve um retrofit and making the current housing stock fit for purpose but new housing is appearing all the time and you want the houses that are built now fit for the future you don't want yeah i have heard one architect say the only good thing you can say about some of the housing he sees it's new, it's it's ripe for retrofit from the day it's completed yeah that's ridiculous lovely so anyone else got any more questions uh yes me go for it sophie Yes, thank you. Um, I was wondering how solar energy technology is evolving and where is the research going in that domain? So at the Low Carbon Hub, we're not directly involved in innovation around solar PV, although there are companies in Oxford um, that are doing all sorts of innovation improving the efficiency of panels and you've definitely seen those improve and as well as um, there's new technologies um, that you read about so um, whether or not it's actually windows so you could turn windows into um, to capture solar there's a lot more happening more with things like floating solar, solar PV um, but where we're more involved is how you can use solar um, an existing solar in um, in tandem with other um, other technologies, like could you combine solar with batteries? Could you something like the solar park? It will be about saying how might that tip into um, there's flexibility, which is about how you change how you um, the time that you generate or storing so that you can make the grid work in a more efficient way. Um, and so solar is going to have a really big part to play in that without necessarily the solar itself, the technology and the solar having to change. It's more the way that it interacts with the grid. Okay, thank you. Nicola, I saw that you had a question. Hi, I've got uh, quite two questions actually for Rachel, if that's okay. 
Um, the first is, um, what percentage of funds at the moment would you say are actually invested in ethical or environmental funds? Like, is it like a really small amount? Is it growing? What, what tra are you seeing a move to that kind of investment? And the second one, the second question, <laughs> being like a journalist. Now, um, the second question is, um, for ethics, how do you select companies to invest in? So two questions. Great. Uh, thanks. In terms of the funds growing, I don't have the I don't have any numbers to hand. I mean, I was looking for the presentation, looking at um, you know the usual uh, argument is, do you have to forego interest to invest sustainably? Um, and I was looking at some of the latest research, you know, from the Guardian saying that, you know, actually, if you compare ethical funds to um, more mainstream, um, they perform as well, if not better. Um, but certainly just anecdotally, you know, and what we're sort of hearing from peers within the within the ethical space is, you know, our investments were up 20 percent last year across both both platforms, you know hearing from people like Hargreaves for Lansdowne and others and Rathbone Green Investment Bank that they're having, you know, significant interest. Um, I just can't quantify that. I, you know, I can definitely sort of come back and look. Um, but certainly anecdotally from the organisations we know, those that are offering ethical alternatives have done considerably, you know, better in 2020 as people I think have had the time and the space and obviously with the, you know, the pandemic, just to think a little bit more about where their money goes. Um, how do we select organizations for ethics? So, so for us, it's all about this active, you have to make a positive contribution. Um, and, you know, typically um, most of what we've done as Saskia said have, has been with um, community benefit societies co-ops really wanting to do things differently and our founder um, was you know all about trying to create stakeholder value so that money and value isn't kind of siphoned off by shareholders and directors to the detriment of where you know something is built um, so for us you know it, it tends to go through the the board directors and we look at the you know we look at the sector um, we look at the directors and we make Saskia and those guys jump through hoops in terms of KYC, you know, your customer and, and the business models. But fundamentally, you know, we'll look at new sectors as long as they fit the proviso that, um, you know, they're rooted in the community. And that could mean profit for purpose businesses now that but have some kind of lock within their articles of association that means that they're, you know, they're, um, their value isn't going to be, it's going to be rooted in, you know, that membership um, based approach. Um, but yes, it, it's, you know, it can be different sectors. It's just they have to, you know, make a positive contribution. Um, so typically, yes, it's in, it's driving innovation in eco agriculture and housing, you know, and, and dealing with some of the societal issues where we've just got these systemic failings where community organizations are just looking at a different way yeah, a bit like low carbon hub with project leo you know really trying to innovate in ways that can scale and we're sort of looking for that um and and you know knowing that that will appeal to our investor base and, and what percentage of your the things that you invest in have a, a climate related is it all climate related or is it some of it community social pur purpose what so <laughs> For us, um, it has to do one or the other. So it has to be about people or planet and invariably they get wrapped together. But I would say, you know, having looked at our impact and where we grew from, a lot of it was out of community energy. So if I had to put a uh, figure on how that 100 million sort of breaks down is, is environmental and then the social aspect. The house release. It's not old, but it's not new, but it's, 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 you know, it's got a gas boiler and all the rest. And I suppose I, I do have solar panels, but the issue for me in a lot of this is the vast array of, of companies, you know, some of whom are good, some of whom are bad, some of whom are probably real cowboys. I mean, I think with our solar panels, we got away with it, but some of their people were definitely 
on the cowboy side. And um, so I think that's what puts you off um, really digging into that area to, um, you know, to consider your, your own home. You know, you yeah. get people calling you up and, and they pretend we say, I'm a government advisor. Yeah. And as soon as I hear that, I think you're like the people who say they're from BT or whatever. You have no idea what they do. Yeah, I'm sorry, I cut you off there. No, no. So, um, Cozy Homes Oxfordshire is our pilot project, which is um, designed specifically to help people through that. We've partnered with Retrofit Works, who are a cooperative who've developed a. They take this whole house approach. So, um, they, I think they particularly they're people with a lot of background in the industry, and they were really aware of that issue of who do you trust. Um, what knowing which technologies are the right technologies for your specific house and property and often it's an order so you might not be able to do everything at once but if you do one thing before you do the other you're then having to rip at that thing out to do the next one and so that's what they've developed the whole house plan approach so um, through that you can you do the plan builder then you can have a whole, um, commission a whole house plan and then they can help you go through the whole process, um, finding quotes, working with the contractors. Um, it, is, it is a pay for service though. It's not something that, um, and, and so, you know, the one challenge is how do you make a service run and deliver and help people through? The next challenge is then going to be, how do you do that in a way that's accessible to everybody? Yeah. And do they, I mean, are there equivalent schemes elsewhere outside Oxfordshire? Not that it applies to me, but... Uh... Um, so um, we're just coming to the end of um, a, our funding, which was um, through Bayes, um, the um, government department, and they funded five or six pilots to try this. One's in Manchester, a couple in Sussex, London and uh, Bristol. So there are a number of people all looking to see how this can be tackled because it is a massive issue at the mm. state of the housing stock. Thanks. Lovely. Anyone have any more questions? Just on the on the back of that, there's also for people who can't afford uh, organisations like Cozy Homes that, and I can never get the initials right. Is it NHB? No. So are you thinking Help about? Me. Uh, BHBH, better That's house, better one. health. <laughs> but I can never, I may have told you some of the words wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and that is for people in receipt of benefits. Yeah. Um, and, and also, they're, they're great helpline. Um, they highly recommend contacting them. They're run by the National Energy Foundation. They run the service in the background. But if yeah. you go to your local council website, they have more details or I can forward that through as well. Yeah, I saw a webinar with them and they said that even if you're not, sh if you're not sure, you could get your initial uh, look at from them. Yeah. And then you can go to places like Cozy Homes to take it further. Yeah, that's a really good suggestion, Terry. Yeah. <laughs> Please. Any more questions? We've got a couple from Facebook. So um, if no one has any more questions, I'll just go through those quickly. No, nope. lovely. Right, so um, one of the questions was, I, I guess this is aimed more towards Saskia. Is it true that solar energy is getting more expensive, especially in comparison to wind power? If you don't, I, I prepared a couple of slides on this one because you forewarned me. So if you don't mind, I'm very quickly going to share again. Lovely. Um, so, um, go back. I found a couple of tables um, to show. This shows um, each block of columns is a different sort of um, energy technology, and the grey, light grey, red are showing. Um, what the levelized cost of the power from those sources are. And levelized is when you um, even out what all of the, um, the costs associated with delivering it from. So, for example, solar power's got a massive upfront 
um, cost associated with putting the panels, but then it's very cheap to run. Whereas gas, you've got to keep supplying the gas. So it's trying to find a way of comparing them. And what you'll see here is that the cost uh, of what, these are government figures of what the government um, just in the last seven years says that the levelized cost of um, wind and solar has fallen massively. Um, and it's being driven by, first of all, um, these things are getting bigger. It's getting more efficient um, and also the operational experience. So whereas before you might have said that the um, lifespan of a solar park was 20 years, you can now say it's 30 or 40 years because with experience, we're discovering that these things keep on generating much longer. And if you look into years ahead, um, the yellow one down here is solar, so they're predicting this is um, current year and the far side is 2040, so they are predicting that the prices are going to continue to decrease. So to get back to the question, I think that if you looked particularly at this last one, solar is actually still cheaper if it's large solar but it hasn't fallen so dramatically in price. So offshore is kind of catching it up, if that makes sense. What's CCS? Uh, uh, carbon capture and storage, I think. Yeah, it is, the evil in the room. Sorry, <laughs> I did laugh when I saw gas and CCS going, oh dear. <laughs> Trying to keep the fossil fuels there by yeah, storing the carbon underground. I think it's that's really interesting. I saw an in, an article recently that it said that some investors are a little bit wary of solar because um, it was something like uh, gas would have to, oil would have to be below one hundred and fifty dollars a barrel for it to be feasible. So I guess the biggest thing is for for solar to become cheaper, and it looks like it's going that way. Well, and also, when are we going to start reflecting the true cost of oil? Yeah, exactly. Lovely. So I've got a couple. Oh, yep. Yeah, go for it. Just related to you, you had nuclear. That's the, the one that bugs me because the government seemed to cl class that as a green energy, but it has so many hidden or not so hidden costs. Well, very interestingly on that, and I took that from Carbon Brief um, and nicked it from a blog of theirs. Very interestingly, the government haven't um, recalculated the levelized costs of nuclear so um, there was nice 2020 bar for all the other ones but nothing for nuclear so um mm -hmm. read into that what you will because <laughs> <laughs> it's too high right so one more couple more questions um for rachel this one's from Facebook. Is it possible to find green managed funds that have been screened for their credentials by some recognized green body? So, yes. I mean, I'd just back to so slightly repeating um, what I said earlier. I would look at something like 3D investing and that's all they do year in, year out, really scrutinize funds. Um, and then look at, yeah, the funds that are offered on big exchange because again they've scrutinized those funds um, to the nth degree and they've only listed the top 12 um, funds from an ethical and, and sustainable perspective. Yep you've given some great links for us to look into. Well, Any more questions? <laughs> I just like I mean I just think that and any money that is it taken from a in it and put into a uh, environmental fund is, is is good, right? So sometimes it doesn't have to be that difficult. Uh, it's just a question of moving a fund from from one investment trust on a platform like our group lands down to another. And uh, if, if everyone can do like a, a small amount of that, then we'll be in a better place. Yeah, and that's really true. I mean, that's um, some of the impacts of the, the program own it that, you know, the peer to peer is, is you know, how much money has moved by um, people feeling empowered to do that. And I think um, the last 
meeting I was at, um, they said that just short of two million pounds, you know, was going to be moved on the basis of people just feeling more confident that they knew what decisions to make and what to look for. Um, so I think you're right. It's just yeah. it's just people feeling confident to do it. Um, and from a gender perspective, it tends to be from all the research that men are just a bit more willing to take risks and women are really motivated to do it, but just want to know more. Um, hence the whole, yeah, the whole reasoning behind setting up um, Own It. The, um, I, I watched a webinar and, and the, they were sort of talking together and they said the single most important thing anyone can do towards climate change is to check, take their money out of the poor investments, the, the oil and gas and fossil fuel investments and move them to green investments. Well, I mean, absolutely. And you saw with COVID, which was really, you know, kind of, it's been an interesting time, but you saw, you know, a lot of those companies that have been the stalwarts of the pension funds issuing profit warnings. And it's almost, you know, COVID's just manifested everything and brought everything, um, you know, to the fore. So it's happening much more quickly. And I was like, oh my God, I never thought that I would see that. You know, all those arguments going, it's going to come back. They can't keep making money. And, you know, these profit warnings were coming out. And I think it's really made people think that they just aren't the cast iron, bankable investments that a lot of people, you know, have thought that they were for years and years and years. Uh, I would have thought that green and uh, investing is, is um, that should be a profitable thing, really, because that's that's where the money is going to right uh, that's our energy is transitioning over to renewables um that's the growth area totally so, but i think you know where saskia and i both sort of come from is that do you want to have that you know democratizing community owned or do you want to have eon coming in with you know a bunch of offshore wind turbines that's great but you know that value then gets exploited and taken outside of the uk and We've had that for years and years and years. So to have community owned renewables, um, I'm just thinking about, you know, the, the, the typical ways of setting up, you know, of funding more capitalist ventures, you know, where it's really high growth and you push businesses really hard and, um, you know, then they can sometimes get into trouble. So you can see some kind of investors coming in um, that don't offer long term patient capital and really drive good organizations you know too hard too quickly and then they you know they don't they don't make it in the medium to long term when fundamentally they should they've got a sound business model so yeah there's um i guess it depends where you get your finance and how patient it is and, and what it's doing for the business as well lovely so um do we have any more questions <coughs> Lovely. Um, one from me. So what do you think about the passive versus active investments um, in terms looking at it through a green perspective? Because obviously, if you're a, an active invest investor, then you can or if you're in an active investment fund, then they'll, you know, pick and choose the, the good, the good green investments while a passive one, not so much. So what's your view? Uh, <laughs> I guess it does my background. I'd always be looking at, I mean, look at the returns, you know, and, and but but for me, it's people like um, web sustainability funds, it's the active funds that are really, you know, pushing to um, deliver new and innovative things and, and kind of delivering on the SDGs. You know, they're the ones that deliver, you know, so much more, whereas a passive fund, okay, you're not, you know, you're not putting your money in stuff that is really distasteful, but also you're not really, um, pushing the climate agenda in a proactive way or, or essentially the SDGs, depending on how that fund's measuring um, itself. So for me, you know, have a look at the returns, but the impact's really critical. So I personally, uh, you know, be looking for one that goes further and is, is more engaged and active. Yeah, I think that's, that's really interesting. Lovely. So that's all the questions from Facebook. Um, no one else has any more questions or anything more to add? No. 
lovely. So um, thanks everyone for joining oh, us wait, today. Wait, wait. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I just wanted to say um, that our next event is on electric vehicles. Yeah. Um, Terry, can you remind me the date for that? I think it's the 14th of April. Uh, well, it's on our, so you, that's, um, that event's on our, on our events page on our website. So if you'd like to come to that, um, you can register for free. That's what I wanted to add. Thank you. And I noticed it's Anthony Simpson, who used to work at the Low Carbon Hub, who's given that talk and he views cars. Well, you can see, you can ask him if he still views cars as batteries on wheels. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. And thank 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 you as well to the uh, to um, to Rachel and, and Saskia yeah. and, and also Sammy and, and Sophie for organising. Thank you very much. Thank it was very interesting. Yeah, thank you. No, thank you so Thanks, much everyone. for yeah for giving your time to come and listen to what we're doing. So really really yeah. Yeah. Like Saskia, it. you should come uh, register to come to the meeting, and you can ask Anthony yourself. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> Actually, I was thinking about making my husband register because he's the one who's he's um, been borrowing an electric car to get to and from work at the moment, <laughs> and he's quite interested. So uh, I, w I had actually clocked that. I was. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Nice to meet you all. Bye. 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 Bye.